let's look at the euro versus the Australian dollar. First off, read this disclaimer carefully. Let's look at the various uh, currencies. Uh, I have uh, identified three primary types of money. You got real money, cryptos, and forex. This is, of course, forex. And we will look at this pair, where the euro is uh, the base. Here you can see um, that it is s around 8% of the 52-week lows, minus 14% away from the 52-week uh, highs. Some recent price action. And here is some data here about Australia. This is the GDP. The consumer price index uh, change, change is 1.3%. Total tax rate is 47.50%. And this is actually uh, forested area, 16%. Uh, percent. The order of the day is that we will first look at the chops, and then we will have a very critical segment about how to manage positions and a bit about statistical correlations. We are using weekly data points. One data point is uh, one week and we have a lot of history here going all the way back to 1996. Let's look at what happened in the previous uh, you know, stock market, uh, bear markets, because we have bear markets in commodities, forex uh, stocks. Let's now look at the dot-com bubble. Uh, so let's here find, this is, you know, the year 2000. You can see here that the euro actually strengthened vis-a-vis -vis the Australian dollar. Even though it was a very erratic, uh, very erratic behavior, big rallies, big sell-offs. Let's actually measure this move here. That's, uh, you know, almost a 16% rally. Here you have the 2007 to March 2009 housing bubble. You can see that the euro actually strengthened very aggressively into September 2008. From this low to this high, that's a whopping 33%. But then something very interesting happens. In the, you know, when that, when that, you know, bear market uh, ended, you can see here that the euro actually weakened very dramatically, from this high to this low. Here, that's a whopping minus forty four percent. That's that's a very interesting uh, observation. And here, as we saw, this is the end of the dot com bubble, and you can see that the euro weakened here as well, meaning there is a pattern here. Okay, so what is happening now? Here we saw a spike heading into a stock, you know, a, a bear market in stocks. Here we also saw some spike heading into a bear market in stocks. And interestingly, we have recently had a spike here in the euro. Does this confirm that we have, uh, you know, a global bear market in stocks? Well, it's, it certainly corroborates that theory. We are seeing some similar behavior. And based on the previous bear markets, we can then make the assumption that throughout the earlier parts, uh, well, extending actually significantly into the bear market, we will see the euro strengthen. At least, at least that has been the tendency. This current behavior is more similar to what we saw in the dot-com bubble, very erratic behavior, but overall a rally in the euro. We are currently seeing a very significant pullback, like we saw in the dot-com bubble, but based on you know the pattern we have seen, there is the expectation that we will pull back to the 50-week moving, moving average here in green, and then like we have uh, some further uh, spikes when we do get you know a bigger pullbacks in the stock market of course there is no guarantee that the patterns will repeat themselves we just have to base our assumption on previous data there, there's obviously a pattern here something else that you can see here is that there's a lot of cycle patterns uh, let's actually do some cycle analysis we have to go here, I look at the time cycles, hmm. 
let's try this. Okay, so here I can see that there are there are these cycle patterns rising, declining, rising, declining, rising, declining. Currently, we I mean the patterns are actually quite uh, repeatable. So there's a very interesting cycl cyclicality here. Here we have a rising, declining cycle. Based on the cycle patterns, we would expect um, maybe a couple more weeks of pullback and then another uh, rally upwards. Of course, when you see these cycle patterns, you have to be very careful about, you know, assuming that they are going to just repeat themselves with price action. But there is obviously another pattern here uh, with these cycles. Very interesting. Okay, so we are above uh, most of the key moving averages. Here are some uh, support levels. And you can see that the 50 week moving average in green, it's been a, a support level many times. Tons of history with that moving average. Looking at the daily data points, you can see that the red 200 day moving average is where there's been tons of activity. Buy, buy, buy. Here we do slip below. Buy, and then here the buyers stepped in surgically. I mean, look at this candlestick here. Surgical test of the 200 day moving average. We are using daily data points now. And then you can see the euro strengthen. Very, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Looking, looking at the weeklies, there is a 43% positive correl correlation between this pair and the S&P 500. Okay, interesting stuff. Let's talk about the importance of actively managing positions, because it can have a huge impact on the gains or losses that you face. Okay, the thing is that you will ha always have winners and losers. Nurture your winners and remove the losers. The interesting thing is that even a 50-50 stock picker can profit. It doesn't have to be stock, it can be forex, it can be uh, commodities, bonds. But even if you are 50-50, 50% correct, 50% incorrect, you can actually profit because of this. Okay, so let's say that your portfolio contains 10 new positions. If 5 rise nicely, then the percentage gain from those 5 will weigh more than the loss of the other 5 if, and there's a big if, if the losers are removed while losses are small. That is, use stops. Let's look at the topic of statistical significance. Whenever you invest in anything, you have an hypothesis about, you know, what is you think will happen. Maybe the, as an example, let's say that the euro is going to go up. That is your hypothesis. But you should also have the antithesis, which is that, okay, the euro is actually going to weaken against the Australian dollar. Okay. Hypothesis H1. We will see a sell-off because price is meeting rejection. Okay, this example, of course, is not based on uh, the Euro-Australian dollar pair. In this instance, you have a bearish hypothesis. Okay, so let's change. The, let's change the example. Okay, so let's say that you think that uh, we have a global bear market in stocks. Okay, let's change it just to make the example fit this. So the hypothesis is, because you think we have a bear market in the stock market, we will see a sell-off because pricing, price is meeting rejection. Okay, that's the hypothesis. Let's continue. But then you create a null hypothesis, which is also called the antithesis. And that is that there is no statistical significance between the two variables in the hypothesis. So the two variables is... Um, the price and the price and uh, that, as an example, the moving average, which is the, re the rejection uh, uh, indicator. As a researcher or a trader, you want to stress test your hypothesis with the null hypothesis. The critical thing is to see if there is a statistically significant relationship between the two variables. One of the ways you can investigate this is by using uh, the correlation indicators that I showed you in this video. Because if there is a strong correlation between, um, as an example, 
the stock market and uh, let's say a forex pair. We didn't see a strong correlation in this video, but let's say there was a strong correlation. Then we could assume that these products are going to move more or less together. Of course, if you have access to uh, advanced statistical programs, then you can do analysis of, um, you know, more specific analysis between what you're going to invest in and the host of uh, specific variables. What I showed in this video is very like grunt level statistical analysis, but that is easiest to, uh, to show. Because the other programs, yeah, they have a high barrier of entry. Statistical significance is often referred to as the p-value, also called probability value. We often reject the null hypothesis, you know, the antithesis, if p is less than 0.05, meaning there is only a 5% chance that the results are random. And there's a big, you know, this big like, oh, okay, beware, beware, reliable statistical tests require a large sample size, meaning many observations. Let's uh, use this uh, pair, the Euro slash uh, Australian dollar, as an example of sample size. So let's say that you want to investigate the relationship, the statistical relationship between price, actual price action, and let's say the red 200 day moving average. In this instance, you can see that we have many data points. Let's actually measure how many data points we have. Okay, so from here to here, this represents 246 bars. Okay, so we have 246 bars. And here is the red 200 day moving average. If throughout this entire period, price action only touched the red 200 day moving average, let's say like two times, then two times out of 246, that is not statistically significant at all. There is space, even though you do see some interaction, it's very hard to extrapolate from it. But this actual example we have here uh, is very interesting because you, you can see that it actually is quite frequent. Here we have a test, 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 test. So many times throughout this period you have price action actively interacting with the 200 day moving average and in most cases here what happens when price action gets to that level the buyers step in. Okay, we can't do a statistical analysis in this program, this program here from investing.com but there's a very high probabil probability that there is a statistically significant relationship here. This is a great example. Uh, this is, you know, high level, you know, big brain uh, take on the markets. But this is this is what you know quantitative analysis analysts uh, do, and uh, this is the major trend in stock market and financial market analysis. You know, forex, you name it, is to look at these kinds of relationships. Because if we do see that from a scientific standpoint, there is a link between a moving average and price action, it means that you can actually, from a scientific standpoint, use that to trade. Uh, you know, meaning that you, instead of high, having like a 50-50% chance of making a profit, you can dramatically increase those odds because there actually is a relationship. Why is there a, a, a relationship? It could be many things. It could, it could of course, be self-fulfilling prophecies. People, all people are looking at the 200-day moving average. You also have, of course, algorithmic trading. And the computer programs, they, they are all about finding patterns, and they will easily see patterns like this and use it for trading. Okay, whatever you do, of course, you want to let the trend be your friend. Uh, be especially careful in these uh, times. If we look actually at uh, the market uh, today, you can see that uh, there is certainly some turmoil. The futures are going down quite uh, significantly here, actually 2% here, S&P and Nasdaq. Um, in the coming days, we will, well, weeks, I guess, but also days, we will have a very clear sign of whether the bounce we saw could lead to a recovery or whether we actually actually are in a long-term bear market. 
So even though the central banks have gone nuclear ballistic, uh, I do think there, that there is a significant probability that we actually will have a full-blown bear market in the stock market, that is. Because um, the central banks have... the very fact that the, that the central banks have gone so far, you know, with trillions of dollars, that is a sign of desperation. Meaning, if we actually had the probability of just uh, recovering from this uh, major plunge, then they wouldn't need to do these programs. You know, there's this, there's this inconsistency there, which I do think that the market could interpret as, at the end of the day, being bearish. That um, you know, the central banks, they can only bail out the market so far, and if you actually look at uh, let's look look at the Japanese well if you well we can do that in another video but if you look at uh, the Japanese stock market as an example because in Japan the central banks have been buying stocks all kinds of ETFs I mean they have just been buying hand over fist and we have not at all seen uh, you know this the Japanese stock market just scream to new highs and new highs what we did see is that the market sort of became sick and didn't really recover notwithstanding the uh, the uh, saving hand of the central bank. Okay, whatever you do, you want to let the trend be your friend, and have a great day and week ahead.